I wouldn't necessarily call myself an expert on CWD genetics, uh, but I may be one of the only people who hasn't retired that is still working on CWD genetics. So, um, so that that's what I'll be talking to you about today. Uh, let's see. Um, so just just an outline. Can you guys hear me in the back? Is the mic working? Okay. Okay. Um, just an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, First, I'm going to kind of talk about genetic resistance, susceptibility, uh, and other prion diseases, how, how they kind of serve as a model for, for what we might be able to do with chronic wasting disease. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about what we know about genetic susceptibility and resistance uh, to, to CWD itself in, in different cervid species, uh, and then kind of touch on the, the long and the short game uh, of chronic wasting disease. You know, what's going to happen in the next... 10 to 20 years, what's going to happen um, in, in years beyond that, um, and how we can sort of maybe guess what Mother Nature has in store for deer and CWD and try to, you know, maybe beat her at that game if we can. Um, and, and then I'll talk about the role of genetics in managing farm cervids. I work uh, pretty hand in hand with the farm cervid industry. Um, and, uh, and and how we can use what we're learning with the farm cervid industry to help the, the wild cervids, uh, both you know in North America uh, and and other places that that you know are currently dealing with CWD now, uh, and then kind of go over summary and conclusions. Um, so we've had uh, you know a pretty good introduction so far, but I just wanted to cover some things that maybe uh, not have been covered. Uh, completely. Um, I'll use some abbreviations in my talk. So PRNP, um, this is the gene that, um, that codes for the normal prion protein. So all mammals, um, a, a lot of different species other than mammals too have, have, a, have this prion protein. And this protein is what um, can misfold and cause disease in the host. Uh, and the PRNP gene is, is the one that codes for that protein. Uh, PRP is the actual protein itself. Uh, and that's about 250 amino acids long, depending on what species we're talking about and any modifications. Um, and you can kind of think of the protein like this. It's a, a linear uh, um, group of amino acids. And, uh, um, you know, so the amino acids are all different as we go along the chain of, of that protein. Um, we have an infectious prion protein. So this is what may be found in the environment or in saliva uh, or in, in a carcass, for example. Um, and then, you know, when the host comes along and, and is exposed to that prion protein, the, the likelihood that that animal becomes infected is due in large part um, on the, uh, on the makeup of that host prion protein. So you can see these two proteins match up very well. Uh, and so that kind of implies that, that the, that host that comes in contact with this infectious protein, um, may be at a, is probably going to be a higher risk, uh, of developing CWD, for example, than a host that has, you know, maybe a single amino acid difference and changes the shape of that protein subtly just enough that, um, that it's, um, maybe not immune, uh, but potentially resistant to some degree to infection. Um, and so just some background on, on prion resistance, um, at least from, from what we know um, in other cases. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about BSE. Most, most of you know that as mad cow disease. Uh, Kuru, which is um, a, a disease of, of um, people of this 4A tribe in, in Papua New Guinea, which is down near um, Australia. Uh, it's a transmissible prion disease um, that, that arose through cannibalism there. Um, CJD is uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, which is a naturally occurring uh, human prion disease. Um, and there are spontaneous forms. So, you know, potentially one in a million people will develop CJD just because they've, they've had a mutation in their prion protein and that kind of precipitates the, the, um, the disease. Um, genetic diseases, so people may be born with specific genetic um, mutations or malformations that, that um, you know, make them more likely to develop CJD later in life. Uh, and then variant CJD, which is that form of CJD, which was linked to mad cow disease, um, you know, 20 or so years ago. And we saw most of those cases in the UK and Europe. Um, and then uh, sheep scrapie, which is a prion disease of sheep. We've heard a little bit about that so far. Um, 
So as far as resistance in, in humans to, to prion diseases, there have been um, a couple of, of genetic differences that we've noticed um, that may make humans more or less susceptible to CJD or VCJD. Uh, and so with VCJD, um, what we found was that, uh, or, or what, what researchers found was that there was a difference potentially uh, at codon 129, so am amino acid uh, 129, uh, if that was an M, uh, methionine, or a valine, um, people with 129M were more likely to develop VCJD if they were exposed to BSC. So I think, um, you know, the majority of cases of, of VCJD that arose from BSC were uh, people who were homozygous for this 129M uh, allele. Uh, and, and just as a reminder, there are about 224 cases that we know of worldwide uh, of VCJD as a result of um, contaminated uh, beef in, in Europe, um, UK, and elsewhere. Uh, Kuru, so one interesting study that came out a couple years ago, uh, so we knew about this, this difference at 129. They also found in a population of uh, the 4A tribe um, in, in Papua New Guinea, they, they found some mutations in, in uh, some members of those tribes uh, where uh, if they had a 127G, um, they may be more susceptible to developing Kuru if, if they had uh, I'm misplacing what the, what the um, alternate allele was. Uh, but, you know, if they had this other allele, they would be completely resistant to Kuru. Um, and uh, so just as kind of a um, background information there, the, the local prevalence, prevalence of Kuru in, in those tribes was about 5%. Um, they were seeing about 1,000 cases, uh, and, and the entire population was about 40,000. So it was pretty high. Um, uh, okay. So... You know, we know a little bit about human prion diseases and resistance, uh, and what, where most of the work has been done is in resistance to sheep scrapie. Um, and so there, there was a lot of work done about 20 years ago looking at the different genetic variants of the prion protein in sheep. Uh, and what they found was that there are variations at positions 136, 154, 171. Um, so, you know, just three simple changes, uh, and, and even just one simple change, uh, was enough to make sheep, um, you know, different scales of resistance. So uh, moderately resistant or, or all the way up to completely resistant, um, at least to natural exposure. Um, and using that information, so once they were able to identify sheep that, that were potentially resistant to scrapie, uh, you know, through artificial selection, they could they could then uh, breed rams and ewes, which were known to be more resistant, and um, eventually reduce uh, the prevalence of scrapie in in blackface sheep, at least, uh, from about one percent to now down below um, 0.01 percent. So, uh, you know, an over a hundredfold reduction uh, in scrapie in sheep, uh, and and. You know, Tracy mentioned today to me that that um, you know it's it's getting harder and harder to find uh, scrapie infected sheep, and and so um, this is a pretty good model uh, for what we could potentially do uh, with with deer and elk if if we learn more about resistance um, and uh, and you know apply that knowledge to uh, breeding uh, resistant animals. Um, the important thing to note is that. Um, these resistant sheep, so um, ARR, so that these are amino acids at 136, 154, and 171. So ARR sheep, um, they're not completely resistant to scrapie itself. If you um, expose them experimentally, uh, you can still induce scrapie. Um, but under natural conditions, you know, if you put a, um, one of these ARR sheep out in a pasture that's had scrapie, uh, in their natural lifetime, they're not going to develop scrapie. Uh, but if you injected it right into their brain, um, you know, within four to five years, they, they would probably go on to develop scrapie. So that's an important thing to, to remember. They're resistant naturally, but not completely resistant. Um, okay, so what do we know about CWD resistance in, in deer and elk? Um, well, we've, we've looked pretty extensively at, at the genetics of, of um, white-tailed deer especially. Um, we found a few different polymorphisms at position 95. 
Uh, 96 is the one that you'll hear a lot of talk about, and that, the reason for that is that it's probably one of the more common polymorphisms um, that's out there. Um, but there are also polymorphisms at 1, 116 uh, and 226, and these are much less common. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about that in the next slide. Uh, in mule deer, um, there are polymorphisms at position 225. Uh, in elk, we're mostly looking at uh, polymorphisms at 132, um, but we should remember that um, elk, the elk prion protein compared to the deer prion protein, there's already, already a polymorphism at 226 that probably helps explain why elk, uh, as Dr. Samuel mentioned, are, um, you know, elk in the same area as white-tailed deer um, have about a five-fold reduction in susceptibility. It can probably be traced back to this single difference that elk have here at position 226 um, that, that's not found in deer. Uh, but beyond that, there, there is a polymorphism at 132 that, that we can kind of take advantage of to make even more resistant elk. Uh, in reindeer, there, there are a couple spots. Um, I think this is off a bit. I think this should be 225Y. Um, but 225Y reindeer are potentially more resistant, um, and 138S reindeer are potentially more resistant than 138N reindeer. Um, so, you know, we know a lot about resistance in the different species of cervids. Um, there are probably uh, polymorphisms out there that we just haven't found yet that, that um, you know, may potentially uh, be more useful than those that we've found so far. Um, but the important thing to remember too, is that um, these polymorphisms, they don't produce, um, you know, a, a perfect immunity. These animals are resistant, um, but they're not completely immune to CWD following natural exposure. Um, so uh, what, one thing we can look at is um, the frequency of these alleles in nature. So how commonly, if we were to go out and sample a bunch of deer or a bunch of elk, how commonly would we find these alleles? Uh, and then if we looked at how commonly those animals were infected compared to, you know, a standard, uh, what we consider the 96G allele uh, to, to be um, the most prevalent and, and the most likely to develop disease. Um, how commonly are these, uh, these less common alleles um, found to be infected? So just to kind of run through this quickly, uh, like I said, the 96G is, is the most common allele that we see in nature. Um, more than 70% of the animals out there will have that allele. 96S is, is often talked a lot about in terms of resistance and susceptibility. Uh, less than 20% of the animals out there have that allele. Uh, 95H, 116G, 226K, these are all very uncommon. So, you know, generally less than 5% of the animals will have one of these alleles. Uh, if we look at the odds ratio of infection, uh, 96S animals. So, uh, you know, this this reduces um, the, the um, you know the chance that you that you find an infected animal uh, that has this 96s allele uh, is you know about uh, you know if you found 10 uh, 96g animals you'd find six uh, 96s animals and. You know, the important thing is that these go down much, much lower. Um, these, these animals with these rare alleles have a much less, are, are much less likely to be infected uh, than those uh, with the more common allele. So, you know, the question is, can we find these animals, maybe figure out um, better how, how uh, much more resistant they are, uh, and then probably at the same time we need to try to figure out why they're so uncommon. So uh, Tracy mentioned this a little bit. We don't, we don't know re really why these animals are present um, at such a low frequency in nature, but it, you know, it's potentially because uh, you know, something like they, they don't breed well um, or they um, tend to get hit by a car more frequently or get eaten by a mountain lion. We don't really know why that is, but you know, for whatever reason, they're less common in nature um, and at the same time less susceptible to infection. Uh, in elk, it's a similar story. We were not working with, an, with as many alleles, uh, but the 132L allele, uh, only about 20% um, or less of the animals have this allele, uh, but they are about um, one-fourth as likely to develop uh, disease than, than the 132M alleles are. Uh, and this is, um, this is a kind of a meta-analysis meta that we did uh, that's, that's currently in press. I can say that as of today. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Samuel presented this slide earlier. 
this, this is uh, from a review that, that um, Dr. Jurgen Richt and I published earlier this year, um, but this just kind of goes over you know, what, what does it exactly mean for animals that have these alleles? Uh, and so we have 96 GG homozygotes, 96 SS homozygotes, and heterozygotes here. Um, there's what's probably uh, a longer course of disease in, um, in 96 SS animals, but, um, you know, there's the potential that, uh, you know, they're not, they don't start shedding until um, much longer after they were infected. We don't really know too much about this yet, uh, but um, you know, the, from a management perspective, um, you know, this this is a normal life expectancy for a deer in captivity, um, and um, you know, so 96 SS animals might be living a long time and uh, potentially shedding for longer. But um, Kelly, do you know the average age of the of deer in Michigan, harvested deer in Michigan? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So the so the argument the argument is um, you know if we have resistant animals they're potentially shedding for longer, um, but what happens if you know if we take into account that you know they're dying at a year and a half or two years of age, uh, and so you can kind of see that this um, this graph really gets cut off um, if we're if we're only dealing with 96 GG animals, um, sure, the, the shedding is going to continue, but uh, with 96 SS animals, um, you know, at a year and a half or two and a half years of age, uh, we're going to significant, potentially significant, significantly reduce the amount of shedding um, that, that's, that's, uh, that can be present. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit, what, what's the long and the short game of CWD? Uh, and so most of you in Michigan are, are pretty well aware of what, what's gone on in Wisconsin, uh, being a pretty close neighbor. Um, over the past uh, 20 years or so, um, so one of the first things that kind of sets in is public fear. Um, there, there are, you know, there's a lot of concern in the public, um, and especially now so that, that we're, um, you know, potentially worried about transmission into humans following the, the primate studies. Um, recently, uh, there is a lot of fear that, that the disease is uh, spinning out of control. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of politics involved. Um, I, I haven't worked with many more diseases besides CWD, but I can say that CWD is a very political disease, and I'm sure that all the researchers in here um, and a lot of the public will, will agree with that. There, is, there, um, you know, there are both sides that, that are kind of arguing uh, about different things, whether we're talking about deer farming or, um, or deer urine or how best to manage um, the disease. There, there, are, there are always multiple sides, and, and there, the, we have a, a real problem with trying to, with uh, being able to agree on these, these topics. Um, the third thing is pessimism. So, you know, there's concern that, um, you know, no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to fix the problem. And, and, um, uh, and, and so, you know, these are the kind of things that, that you guys, that Michigan will see over the next uh, five to 10 to 20 years. There, there'll be public fear and politics and pessimism uh, as far as being able to manage the disease. Um, this is data that I pulled from, from the Wisconsin DNR site. Um, and, and what it kind of shows is that, uh, you know, despite everything that's been done, uh, white-tailed deer numbers are relatively stable. Um, that doesn't mean that the quality of hunting is, is stable, right? These, these are potentially younger animals um, or, you know, the, obviously the disease is getting much worse in Wisconsin. The environment is, is becoming more and more contaminated as the prevalence of CWD goes up. Uh, but white-tailed numbers seem to be stable. Uh, central farmland zone, southern farmland zone, these are the two zones where, where um, CWD is most prevalent in Wisconsin. Uh, and you can see since 2002, the numbers have kind of creeped up a little bit. Uh, again, that's not to say that the population is healthy, uh, but for now, for, for the short game, the whitetail numbers seem to be stable despite CWD prevalence going up. Uh, we don't know what exactly um, you know, what these sorts of, sorts of curves would look like in, in healthy elk or mule deer populations, but um, chances are they wouldn't be as stable as white-tailed deer. And, and in fact, some of the research out of Wyoming um, seems to be showing that, that, you know, that this may not be the case in uh, elk or mule deer, po mule deer populations. 
Um, so the long game. So when I'm trying to figure out um, you know, a solution to CW, I try to think of what Mother Nature is trying to do. Um, and uh, you know, in 20 to 100 years, um, we're going to see a continued spread of CWD across nor North America and beyond. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem like, I, I mean, I, I have a hard time being optimistic about being able to get this disease under control. Um, and, you know, no matter, you know, what sort of legislation we push or, or um, you know, um, permitting we follow, it's, it's going to be really hard to keep CWD in check. And I think we're going to start to see it in more, you know, event, more and more states as, as the years go on. Uh, increased environmental contamination, so places where it's already present, um, it's going to continue to contaminate the environment and that's going to continue to kind of promote spread just like Dr. Samuel suggested. Um, but at the same time, we're going to see microevolution. So what's microevolution? So, um, you know, we know that this 96S um, allele is very is relatively uncommon now, um, but since it's resistant, um, or at least partly resistant, over time we're going to start to see that allele go up, uh, and the 96G allele go down. Um, and at some point, you know, there's going to be kind of a happy balance, um, or, or an unhappy balance between. Uh, you know, the, these alleles and CWD, and most of you are probably familiar with this rabbit and fox population graph. Uh, and the best way to think about this is um, deer as the prey uh, and CWD as the predator. And as CWD prevalence goes up, the deer populations are going to drop uh, until this, you know, one of these resistant alleles starts to come up and become more common, and then the deer will you know, be able to potentially outlive the, the disease. Uh, deer populations will go up. Um, potentially what might happen then is, is the prion agent could adapt to those um, particular genotypes. Um, and, you know, then we'll start to see the CWD agent become more common and the deer populations go down. So this is what's going to happen over the next 20 to 100 years. Uh, and the question is, can we, can we beat um, can we beat this process before it happens um, by identifying deer and elk and, and other species of cervids that are potentially more resistant um, and um, finding ways to uh, to kind of beat this game so so that um, you know we can kind of shut down transmission, shut down environmental contamination, um, and uh, you know and, and try to improve the deer herd um, um, before all of this happens naturally. Um, so what's the role of genetics in managing CWD in farmed herds? Um, so uh, most of you probably know that CWD po positive farms are uh, immediately put under quarantine um, and uh, for the most part they're depopulated. Um, and, and, and so the question now is um, whether you know, we should be depopulating those herds uh, or if we should, should be allowing the, the ranch or the farm to, to remain operational. Um, so some of the pros for depopulating, uh, potentially uh, it should be lowering environmental impact by removing these infected animals off the landscape. You're kind of reducing the impact of CWD uh, on the landscape. Um, reduces transmission across the fence. So if you have a positive herd, um, if you remove that herd, obviously there's not going to be any, uh, or um, CWD won't be moving as readily across the fence if those animals have been depopulated. Um, the, the kind of downside of that is that, um, it, you know, it prevents any sort of improvements in management. Um, and and some, of, some of you may think that that's a good thing, uh, but, you know, I'd argue that there's a lot we can learn about managing CWD uh, by managing CWD in, in a closed herd um, on, a, on a farm or on a ranch um, that we can then apply to, to wild cervids. Um, limits a further understanding of disease. So, uh, you know, we don't really learn much about how the disease behaves in these resistant genotypes. We don't really know what sort of, um, again, it goes back to improving management. We don't really know what sorts of decisions might help, um, you know, reduce prevalence or, or uh, improve herd health. Um, and, and may, you know, maybe most importantly, it puts producers out of business. So, um, you know, deer and elk farmers are, are um, in the agricultural field, just, just like, you know, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people in, um, in this audience. Uh, and, and CWD is, is um, 
kind of a death toll for, for these for these producers. And so, you know, that that in my mind is maybe a big reason not not to um, you know, not to pursue depopulation if we can avoid putting producers out of business. Uh, if they remain operational, uh, we can make more advances in management. Learn about uh, live animal testing. Um, learn about uh, you know what, what role genetics has. We can improve our understanding of the disease, uh, and more importantly, it allows producers to keep their livelihoods. So, uh, you know, it may be risking wild cervids, and it may be environment um, increasing the environmental impact. Those are potential downsides too. Um, so, I wanted to talk very quickly about uh, a management project we've had in ranched elk, uh, looking at four to five hundred uh, head of elk on about five thousand acres in a CWD endemic area. Um, prevalence in the past was, was 10 to 20 percent based on harvest estimates, uh, and we were capable of a yearly inventory in a modern handling facility, so we could collect whatever samples we wanted uh, as quickly as we could um, and use those samples to help manage the disease. Uh, we, we focused on live animal testing through uh, remote tissue, which is rectal biopsy tissue, and we used two different uh, tests. We used the immunohistochemistry test, and we used RT-Quick. Um, the ranch decided that they were only going to cull positive females, IHC positive females, um, and not any RT quick positive animals, not any bulls. Um, what we found, and I'm sorry I have to go over this so quickly, but we're kind of running out of time. Um, and th this is this, in my mind, is really important. Um, this RT quick assay that, that we've talked a little bit about today, um, we found that that it was capable of of, of um, giving us over 35 percent detection ability um, of uh, compared to immunohistochemistry. So RT quick. Uh, we were able to find more infected animals um, generally early, in earlier stages of disease. Um, and, and what does this ultimately mean for you? Well, so my concern is that uh, immunohistochemistry is the standard test that's used for CWD diagnosis in, in the U.S. And um, these findings kind of imply that, that maybe we should be reconsidering what tests that we, um, we should be using uh, and perhaps trying to implement RT-Quick as a diagnostic test for CWD, both anamortem and postmortem. Um, one other thing we found was that these biopsies missed maybe 20% or more of the infected animals. So um, live animal testing is is great. We can we can kind of you know address the problem um, in a in a live herd without having to depopulate, um, but we're still missing a significant percentage of the infected animals in that herd, um, 20% or more. Um, so what we found over two years of the study is that CWD was rapidly shifting the frequency of uh, the PRNP genetics. Um, normally, this, this um, 132 L allele is present in about 15% of the population, um, but in our herd, we're seeing it at 35% or more. And you can, you can kind of see why. These are the, um, the 132 MM animals, 132 ML, 132 LL. Um, it's really hitting these MM animals hard. Um, and within a year or two, we'll, we'll probably have whittled these MM animals down uh, significantly. So all that we'll be working with is primarily 132 MLs and 132 LL animals. Uh, we're finding that CWD targets susceptible animals of a younger age class. So 132 MM animals, um, we're primarily seeing it in, in younger animals, two, four, six, uh, 132 MLs. Um, you know, generally order, older, four, six, eight years old. Uh, we had a single 132 LL positive this year, and she was 11 years old. Um, so this goes back to this graph that we saw here. And, um, you know, if all animals were 132 LL and we, you know, either hunted them or, de or euthanized them before they became 10 years of age, uh, this problem would be a lot less significant in this herd. Um, one other thing that we're working on is developing a pedigree. So we're using microsatellite testing to try to, um, you know, figure out the pedigree of this herd. So basically DNA fingerprinting to kind of see um, who's related to who and how they're related. Uh, and we can use this to help predict the susceptibility. So maybe identify things outside of the 132 L allele in elk um, that may be contributing to resistance um, and also help predict mo mechanisms of transmission. So we can kind of fo follow uh, maternal um, offspring lineages and see how common CWD is going from uh, mother to calf um, and, and down to her calf, for example. Um, unfortunately, you know, this project is kind of coming to a um, coming to a head right now. The the ranch is 
um, dismissing our, our recommendations. So we tried to make recommendations for um, increasing the, um, the number of LL animals in that herd. Um, I, I think that they've kind of um, given up on elk, elk ranching altogether. They're considering selling the ranch and, and maybe soon depopulating. So we'll never quite figure out, you know, what what might have happened. Um, but one thing we learned was that we need to be aggressive in our management um, and, you know, potentially look at what Mother Nature is telling us, that those 132 LL animals are, are more resistant uh, and, you know, we can try to focus on those animals to, um, to help the herd rebound. And we can, you know, hopefully uh, try the same thing in, in white-tailed deer herds and focus on the resistant um, alleles that we know about in white-tailed deer, for example. Um, uh, so genetics, we can use that um, in, in deer farms in endemic or non-endemic non -endemic areas um, to, you know, maybe let, let producers thrive in, in areas where CWD is really common. Um, in non-endemic areas, uh, you know, maybe they can sort of serve as a buffer to prevent um, you know, prevent the expansion of CW. If we have resistant animals um, in, in white-tailed deer herds placed, you know, kind of around around a state, for example, they may, may help kind of slow the spread of CWD. Uh, there are several, several producers out there raising resistant elk um, in Colorado and Minnesota. Uh, we don't have that on the white-tailed deer side yet, so it'd be great if we could have um, some of the white-tailed deer producers looking at um, breeding resistant animals too. Um, what's the role of genetics in managing wild cervids? Well, anybody know what this is? It's, it's the flood map for, for Lansing here. And, and we're right here, talking right here. And, and um, you know, this is, this is um, so we're in a potentially uh, in, in a flood area. Um, we can sort of use that, uh, use the genetic information in the same fashion. Um, so if we looked at the genetics of, of white-tailed deer in Michigan um, and, you know, understood uh, where where those genetics are more or less common, we can might be able to predict where CWD is going to show up next, or or how it might move across the state. Um, but ultimately, understanding the role of of um, resistance uh, in deer and elk, um, we're going to need help with the deer and elk farmers. Um, so just in summary, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, our options for managing this disease are, are really limited. Um, I don't think we'll have a talk about vaccine development here, um, but I, I find the, the potential for a vaccine development really unlikely. Um, implementing that is going to be even harder still. Um, but I do think that genetic management might, might offer uh, or, or might at least represent a viable pursuit. And, um, you know, Dr. Samuel and I talked about this in Wisconsin last year. Um, see, think of CWD like a wildfire. Uh, and, and most of you have probably seen this picture before taken in the Bitter Valley of Montana. Uh, but um, it's, it's going to keep spreading. And so what can we do to try to help, um, help make these animals um, hardier uh, and help prevent it from spreading even further? Um, I, I, I do think the genetics might be um, a, 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 a good route to pursue. So I uh, have a bunch of collaborators um, across North America um, and a lot of help from the, from the deer and elk farming industry. And that's all I've got. Thanks.